Uh, welcome to this lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificate of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. We would like to thank uh, all of our supporters who made this lecture possible. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. Today, we will be hearing from Peter Betke, who will discuss his book, the Road to Socialism and Back, An Economic History of Poland, 1939 to 2019. This lecture is part of our series on the Intermarium, sponsored by the Kuszko Chair of Polish Studies and Center for Intermarium Studies. Peter Betke is a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute, a professor of economic and philosophy at George Mason University, and uh, the director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and BBNT Professor for Study of Capitalism at the Mercatus Center. He received his PhD from George Mason University. Dr. Betke has developed a robust research program that expands an understanding of how individuals acting through the extended market order uh, can promote freedom and prosperity for society and how the institutional arrangements shape, reinforce, or inhibit individual choice that lead to sustained economic development. His most recently published books include F.A. Hayek Economics, Political Economy and Social Philosophy, and The Four Pillars of Economic Understanding. Professor Betke is the editor of numerous academic journals, including the Review of Austrian Economics and the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, and the book series Cambridge Studies in Economics, Choice in Society. He has served as president of the Southern Economic Association, the Mont Pelerin Society, the Association of Private Enterprise Education, and the Society of Development of Austrian Economics. Welcome, Dr. Betke. Thank you very much for having me. I am thrilled to be here. Um, this uh, book project uh, here is uh, part of a, um, a broader project with the Fraser Institution that I recommend to everyone here uh, to look at on the realities of socialism. This is an educational project um, and there's these monographs that different scholars are producing. Um, I also have one coming out on Estonia. And in both cases, <clears throat> I am working with Matt Mitchell and Konstantin Zukov. Uh, Matt Mitchell is a, is a senior fellow at the, um, at the Fraser Institute, and Konstantin is a professor, uh, just started his first job at Trinity University in Texas. Um, and so I recommend to the listeners to go and look up the work of Matt and, and Constantine um, very highly. So this is a project uh, that tries to study the history of the socialist experiment in Poland and to clarify and um, in the most uh, sort of um, convincing way with infographics or whatever, the comparison between Poland and other countries um, as a result of this history. So the basic idea of the socialist experiment in the 20th century uh, derives from our understanding of the teachings of Karl Marx. I'm not gonna go into a long uh, discussion of this. Uh, Marx had uh, very specific claims uh, about alienation and exploitation. Um, those claims fueled the socialist project, uh, which captured the imagination of the intellectual class, especially in the uh, early part of the 20th century, and uh, led to various different um, countries pursuing those kind of ideas. Um, the idea, the key idea to take away from on that 
is that Marx thought the only way that you could eradicate the injustice of capitalism was to uh, replace it, get rid of the alienating ability of mankind. That alienating ability of mankind is private property. And uh, once you abolish private property, you can then substitute in comprehensive planning. You can eliminate the invisible hand and instead have the visible hand uh, of the collective uh, to guide things. And the promise uh, of this was that, um, you know, you would end up by being able to rationalize production and generate a world of abundance and of equality. This was the promise of socialism. Uh, you would rationalize production. Therefore, it would no longer be the chaos of the market society, which suffered from periodic business cycles and, and, and monopoly exploitation. Instead, you would rationalize production, bringing it under a coherent central plan. Um, and you would then generate a burst of productivity. That burst of productivity would allow us to move from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. And you would end up with equality um, as a result in your social relations. The reality of socialism, and these, this is just the data for Poland, uh, is the reality of socialism is, is quite the opposite of that. Um, the socialist experiment um, led to uh, 6 million dead in Poland, uh, three, uh, 340,000 people deported. Um, you know, uh, they lost, uh, you know, uh, $500 million worth of industrial equipment get expropriated by the Soviet Union. They destroyed their cultural assets. Uh, they destroyed, uh, you know, pre-war assets, um, and uh, they destroyed rail lines. And of course, one of the most tragedies of history is what happened in the Canton Forest, in which you have over 14,000 people uh, were murdered uh, by their government. So why? Why would this disjoint happen? This is the question that we're asking in this monograph of why it is that the reality of socialism is so different from the promise of socialism. And the argument that we give in here is basically economics um, and economic theory. And this is uh, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, who are two of the most vociferous criticism, critics of the, um, the socialist system. Uh, they are not exclusively uh, the critics. There's other critics that we draw on throughout the monograph uh, Yanis Kornai, of course, is one of the more contemporary ones and very uh, famous, um, but also uh, Mansur Olson and some other people that we draw on in the book to be able to explore what it is that causes the problem uh, with socialism. But basically, the core idea is that there results ma major issues whenever we try to abolish private property rights. And one of the things to keep in mind is that we want to the socialist project was one of rationalizing exchange and production, which requires us to be able to sort from the array of technologically feasible projects, those that are economically viable, right? So there's many ways to build a railroad. We could build railroads out of, um, you know, platinum, or we could build them out of steel. Why would we choose to build them out of steel? Well, you're going to say to me right away, the reason why you're going to build them out of steel is because that's less expensive than building them out of platinum. But what if we didn't have any prices and no profit and loss calculus to tell us that, right? What we would know is all we would know is the technologically uh, characteristics of the production project. And so rationalization would be impossible in that regard. And one of the things to understand about what it means to be rational is that the economic system has to be able to produce more with less, not less with more. If the economic system is producing less with more resources, that's the very definition of irrational. It's economically irrational. It's economically not feasible, all right? And so the role, the key role in here is that what capitalism can do, socialism cannot do. And so the reason why capitalism works is because it relies on the institutions of property, prices, and profit and loss. Um, these, the property, prices, and profit and loss give us incentives to utilize resources effectively. It gives us information to guide us in the effective use of those resources. 
and it spurs innovation, which follows from the discovery of new opportunities for mutually beneficial exchange and the discovery of least cost methods of, uh, of production, least cost technologies. So in the absence of property prices and profit and loss, how is an economic system going to operate? So the way that we detail this in the uh, book is to describe the difference between the control problem that socialism faces, the knowledge problem that socialism faces, and the incentive problem. And actually to see how those three problems are all interconnected. They're, they're not, they are separate emphasis, but they're all connected to one another. Um, and, 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 and are a function of the fact of the institutional environment of collective ownership of the means of production. All right, so here's an example of the knowledge problem. Remember what I said, that you're supposed to be able to produce more with less, not less with more. And so here's the amount of steel that needed to be consumed in order to produce $1,000 of output uh, during Poland's experience with socialism. It, it took, you know, uh, uh, you know, 135, you know, tons, right, to make a thousand dollars of output here or whatever. So this is a major issue with their ability to allocate scarce resources among competing ends. Okay, what were endemic to these systems? They were shortage economies. Why is it that they face such shortages all the time? This is empty stores and like that. Is because there was no incentives for individuals to provide those goods and services to the individuals in the economy. And they suffered a control problem, which is in order for them to be able to marshal the resources and in particular labor resources, they had to control the population. And so he who does not work, neither shall he eat, uh, right? This is in the Soviet constitution. And as a result of that, you end up by seeing the kind of mass terror that was introduced into this system to basically force the population uh, to be able to um, do what the regime wanted them to do, control them. All right. So the, the arrests, the political imprisonment, uh, the role of the secret police, all of these kind of um, issues that are involved in, in, in Poland. So just to, you know, put a fine point on this, um, you know, between 1949 and 1954, 84,000 people are sent to labor camps. All right. In 1952, all right, you have 49,000 political prisoners taken. Uh, the secret police totaled in that year 34,000. And the number of informants is 26,000. For those of you who read a lot of Soviet and post Soviet ideas, Orlando Figus in his book Whispers describes the consequences of this kind of society on social life. Um, he describes it as whispers because we have to whisper to one another so that we don't get reported on. But then there's also within our intimates whispers to the leaders who tell on us. And so this is, leads to the whole issue of the living the lie, which was endemic towards the socialist experiments and the destruction of civil society. In, 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 in most parts. In 1962, 13,000 Jews were expelled from the system, one-way tickets out uh, of the system. And so what happens, again, just to, con to put a fine point on this, the knowledge problem means that the price system no longer can serve its function because you've eliminated private property, relative prices through exchange, and profit and loss accounting. So when you don't have property prices and profit and loss, you're going to actually have other mechanisms to determine how it is that we allocate scarce resources among competing ends. You don't get rid of scarcity. You just have to deal with the scarcity situation in a different way. And therefore, what's left? Well, politics. You, you determine the outcomes based on political decision making, not on market decision making. So again, the three problems are the control problem, the knowledge problem, and the incentive problem. Well, what did these problems generate? Well, the idea of socialism is abundance and equality. The reality of socialism is stagnation and inequality. So what we do in the book, and especially through the infographics, is communicate as best as we can the consequences of this stagnation and this inequality. And I'm going to just mention a few of these things right now and give the ideas, but I really recommend people go to the website 
and uh, address those issues. I'm hoping to finish my talk roughly in you know 30 minutes or less, and that way we can have more conversation among people. So I hope that they are, uh, are ready to ask questions. Um, but let's take a look at some of these things. So let's say I wanted to get a car in Poland. I'd have to wait for 15 years at a minimum to get a car, right? I'm queuing up. These are shortage economies, all right? So Poland did not have, I'm not even talking about quality of the car right now, right? I'm talking about just getting a car, being able to utilize a car. How about whether or not, you know, so look at the number of cars compared to other nations. Cars per thousand people in 1987 and compare that to like Western nations like West Germany, all right? And it, it, it's, it's uh, you know, very big discrepancy. How about the number of people that are able to have a telephone service and how much they have to wait in order to get the television service, uh, excuse me, not television, telephone uh, service turned on. So they're subscribers, but they're not able to get their service. And in, in Poland, out of a uh, hundred subscribers in 1980s, only 57 of them had a phone that was, wor you know, I mean, excuse me, 57 of them, all right, so 43, you know, had phones, 57 of them were waiting to have their phones, uh, you know, turned on and working. Um, how much time did it take, hours, to be able to produce basic goods and services? All right, and as you can see here, this is the number of hours that a Polish worker had to work to be able to acquire uh, the, the goods compared to their West German colleagues. So this is, you know, how many more hours did you have to work rather than a West German to be able to get these goods and services? How about just looking at income, right, per person? So per capita income, if you take the United States as 100, uh, you know, 100 percent. So the measure in which we're doing it, Polish Polish citizens were living at 39 percent of the standard of living of the U.S. Again, that that's per capita income, not even including quality of services and whatnot. We tell a lot of different stories in the book about the lack of quality and also access to goods, basic goods and services. Um, that is in there. And, and, and in particular, for example, there's a, a very important story um, that needs to be told about the lack of access to basic necessities that women uh, faced in these countries um, that they were unable to get uh, a hold of. This is Poland's annual inflation rate. Um, as you can see here, you know, in 1990, we're at, you know, 586 uh, percent inflation rate. Um, this relate this is related to the idea that these firms are in fact producing less with more, so therefore they are economically unviable. They are being subsidized. That's what's called a soft budget. That's associated with Yanis Kornai's work. In these administered economies, there's an existence of a soft budget. This soft budget means that the government is expending resources without generating the revenues from these enterprises. So they are in a deficit. And this is what Adam Smith referred to as the juggling trick, which all governments engage in ancient as well as modern, which is that you run, you run deficits, you accumulate public debt, and then what you try to do is monetize that public debt through inflation. And so unless you somehow stop this cycle, you're going to experience this kind of uh, breakdown of the system. And this was true across all the socialist systems. In the Soviet Union, this was a particularly acute um, because of the military expenditures that were huge um, in, in that society. So let's just look at a couple other things before I open it up for questions. So here is Poland's life expectancy. Um, as opposed to the OECD average. Um, as you can see that Poland's life expectancy actually like the Soviet Union had actually declined from the 70s into the into the late socialist period. Um, and this was a very common feature in these economies. Um, and but look how far they they lag behind. The, 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 this is a uh, five years, okay? Um, you know, uh, Pope John Paul, 
comes the power. Um, for those of you who are of a certain age, uh, you'll uh, rem remember how unique it was that we had a Polish Pope. Uh, that used to actually be a joke when I was a kid <laughs> growing up about, you know, you know, about the Polish Pope. Um, but John Paul came there. He was an anti-communist uh, uh, Pope, and he strongly, you know, defended, uh, you know, the solidarity movement uh, in Poland and the anti-communism of this. Uh, this is Lech Walesa, who was the leader of the solidarity movement, um, which is such an important uh, pinnacle to the post-communist uh, and the, the breakdown of communism. This is in the 1980s. The you know all of these countries remember were supposed to be people's republics. They were supposed to be paradise for workers, and this was the workers' union taking on the um, false promises of the socialist system and exposing them to the world. And so you know what happened in Poland was. They suffered a uh, martial law um, and crackdown on the solidarity movement. But one, the crackdown on the solidarity, solidarity movement led to a growing recognition of the moral collapse of the communist system throughout East and Central Europe. And, and throughout the decade of the 1980s, there was reforms and failures, uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, significant of these, of course, is in the former Soviet Union with Mikhail Gorbachev um, and his notion of perestroika, which means restructuring, and glasnost, which means public frankness. So they were going to bring out front, uh, you know, the, the public frankness about the truth. Um, and this is important for the work that uh, I'm doing with Matt and, and Constantine on Estonia, because one of the things that was a key recognition in the Baltic states was truthfulness in 1987 over the Stalin-Hitler pact. Um, but that's a story for another day. Uh, the key thing here is the uh, end of the Brezhnev doctrine under Gorbachev as he was wrestling himself with the reforms in the, in the former Soviet Union. I have a book, by the way, uh, that I wrote many years ago on uh, Gorbachev and the uh, perestroika. It's called Why Perestroika Failed. Um, and uh, so you can easily get it um, either through a pirate copy that's available online or, you know, through, through Routledge. Um, so in, in, in uh, communism comes to an end in Poland and we have a new government established and that new government, the economics of that is led by uh, Lasek Balcerowicz. Balcerowicz is a unique finance minister, one of the really, um, Along with Mart Lahr in Estonia, he's one of the really truly uh, significant um, economic reformers. And he follows a policy basically of what would later be called shock therapy versus, say, gradualism, in which he ends price controls, he lowers barrier to foreign trade, he eliminates restrictions on private businesses, he privatizes the state enterprises. He requires the Central Bank of Poland to focus on controlling inflation. So rather than those high uh, inflation, he brings down that inflation by having inflation targeting. Poland, uh, Pol the Polish Zloty actually becomes very stabilized and during this time. He focuses on getting rid of the soft budget constraints and he ends up by having a simplified uh, flat tax structure. Um, what were the consequences of his reforms? Well, uh, this is real Polish income. It was growing from 1970 to 1991 at about 1.8% per year. If you continue that trend line out, it would have gone from $8,000 per capita income, a little over that, to a little over 14000 per capita income. But what did the reforms that Balcerowicz put forward deliver for us? All right, look at that almost... 32,000 per capita income in 2019. So it's a, a, a drastic trend off the trend line. So you pass the reforms, take a look back, right? This is when the reforms were introduced. Now take a look at what happens as a result of the reforms. It's amazing. Now let's look at some other things that go on. How about life expectancy? Again, life expectancy grows at a very short, small rate. 
All right. If it would have continued, it would have you know grown to 7.1, 71.5. By the way, recently I just became a grandfather, right? It's very important to have this idea of, of, of living longer and more prosperous lives because we get to enjoy things like grandchildren and great-grandchildren and things like that rather than having our life expectancy cut short. Um, for those of you, you know, the point I'm trying to make here um, is really wonderfully displayed in a video by Hans Riesling, um, which you can look up on YouTube. It's called 200 Countries in uh, over 200 years in four minutes, and it's a BBC uh, infographics. And what he basically shows is the transition from countries being poor and sick to healthy and wealthy, and what the relationship of that is to uh, you know life expectancy issues as well as income. And so right now, what we see here is that the trend line would have continued like that had had we gone on. But what did we actually see? Right, we actually see you know a six-year you know. Uh, uh, increase in their life expectancy uh, that's result from that. So increase in the income, increase in per capita income, and increase in uh, their life expectancy. So what did the transition deliver for Polish people living, uh, you know, under this experience? They lived a longer, healthier, and more prosperous lives. Okay, and so this is what's delivered. Now we in the book document a lot. Other things, for example, also the availability of more social services. So, you know, the promise under socialism was that you were going to have an activist state be able to provide, fill in the gaps uh, for those who are most vulnerable um, and least uh, advantaged. And it turns out that economic growth actually ended up by delivering more of those social services to the population than we had under the stagnation and inequality. The other thing that I should point out that we highlight in the book is the pathology of privilege that was associated with the nomenclatura. So some people benefited from the uh, socialist experiment and that were the insiders, about one, about, a, a, you know, like say 1% of the population. Um, and they, they shopped in their own stores. They were able to have uh, travel as they wanted. Uh, you know, they were able to have access to goods and services, which, the normal citizen in Poland wasn't able to have. And that was true across all of the systems, all right? The, the, all of the countries uh, of East and Central Europe. And so th it's a system that benefits a very, very few uh, of its population. Um, yeah, basically about one half of 1% actually is the small privileged elite um, in these societies and the benefits that they had. One of the things that's important to keep in mind when Gorbachev starts in his reforms in the former Soviet Union is there's a famous story that people tell of him walking with Shevardnadze on a beach and realizing that the diplomats who went to Canada and whatnot had a better life access than those who were the political elite back in Russia. And so they made this famous phrase, which was, we can no longer live like this, right? We have to change our way and in Gorbachev's book, one of the things that he used to say all the time was, uh, how can we track Haley's Comet with advanced technology, but yet we can't produce a good uh, toaster for the average consumer in the economy? And this, again, sort of highlights this issue of the promise of abundance, the promise of equality, the reality of stagnation, the reality of, of, um, of inequality. So anyway, this is my summary of the book that we did with Fraser. Um, I believe that on the website that you have for the seminar that a free copy is available for everyone to download in a PDF if they want. Um, there also are physical copies that you can purchase um, as well from Fraser. Um, it's part of a, a broader project, as I said, with Fraser on the realities of socialism. Um, and I really highly recommend taking some time, sharing it with your students, uh, sharing it with other people to, so that, especially young people, as we know, one of the challenges that we face today um, is a rising popularity of, of a, a version of so socialism. And this tries to remind young people of the consequences of this social experiment on the lives of the people that suffered under it. And it's true not only for Poland, but also in Estonia, um, as well as throughout the uh, 
uh, sort of uh, East and Central Europe, um, but you can also see it in, in Venezuela um, and in various Cuba and other experiments that are around the world uh, today that continue to follow it. So this is the book. It's co-authored work with Konstantin Zukov and Matt Mitchell. And uh, I want to acknowledge them. They, it was very important to work with them. And uh, they uh, did a tremendous job um, of lifting in all of this. And hopefully this book will be readable and one that you'll want to share with your colleagues and students. So anyway, that's my summary. Um, I'm willing to answer any questions that people have. Um, and so how do I stop sharing? There we go. OK, so did you stop sharing? No, you're um, you're still sharing your screen, sir. All right, how do I? Oh, you're good. I think you're good there. You're good now. OK, good. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A section um, at the top of your ribbon bar. You should be able to see that. Um, I see one question in here so far, and the question asks, why didn't they reform the judiciary? Oh, this is a, a, a very fascinating question. Um, I'm going to be a little too insider baseball here in a second, which is that Andre Schleifer wrote a really important paper. He was a major uh, reform economist. He teaches at Harvard um, during the, the first decade of the of the this century. Um, he was probably the most influential economist in terms of science, citations, things like that. Um, and uh, now you might argue that that's someone like Darren Asimoglu or whatever, but Schleifer was that character in the late 1990s into the 2000s, early 2000s. And he explored all these issues having to do with regulation, judiciary, everything like that. And he wrote a paper. It's a, it's a very uh, interesting paper to look at. It's in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And it is called uh, On Coasts and the Coastians. And what he does is he divides the world up into judges and regulators. And then he wants to examine when is it that market um, uh, activity is going to be preferred to state activity. And here's where it goes. He says that if you have competent judges and competent regulators, you'll rely on the common law and rely on markets. If you have incompetent judges and incompetent regulators, again, you'll rely on the market uh, because you can't turn to the state or to the courts to solve issues. If you have incompetent judges, excuse me, if you have uh, incompetent regulators, but competent judges, you're going to rely on the market as well. But if you have incompetent judges and competent regulators, then we're going to turn to the regulatory state to, to try to manage things. The judgment in, all, in East and Central Europe was that we had incompetent judges and competent regulators, that trying to fix the, the judicial system was just too difficult because of all the accumulated capital and law that was embedded. You couldn't just transplant the law from the West, but you could transfer expert regulatory advice. So we're going to turn to the you know transition according to Harvard, right? And they're going to be able to then provide the advice on how to reform the economy and how to regulate things like stock markets and other things like that to avoid issues like in in the Czech Republic they call them the pirates of Prague, you know where they had uh, you know um, you know difficulties with uh, the transition with corruption and and, and whatnot. Um, so. That was the basic idea, was that we could fix regulators much quicker than we could fix judiciary. And so that's why the focus was on trying to get the judiciary correct. This also, you know, in Sachs's work, Sachs focused a lot on Poland. And the issue that Sachs uh, would argue uh, was that you had to have, you know, macro stabilization and whatnot. So Sachs was a, a radical reformer but he was a radical reformer to be able to get an economy which could then be regulated to be fine-tuned. So he's not a laissez-faire advocate. 
He was an advocate to get a market, so he was all in favor of quick reforms, but in order then to have the regulatory apparatus of the state, both in monetary and fiscal policy and regulation. Um, now, he is a, he's a tra free trader, so that's different. So there's a question here that was asked about my own work. So I have a paper responding to the Schleifer paper called Check Your Premises. Uh, and check meaning spelt like check because I fo we focused on the Czech Republic in that paper. And we, you know, try to ch challenge the idea about, uh, you know, incompetent judges and competent regulators by trying to show that the regulators themselves suffer from these knowledge problems, these control problems, and these incentive problems uh, and, and whatnot. But uh, if anyone's interested, you just jot me an email at pbetke at gmu.edu and I will send it to you uh, quite easily or just check my SSRN page uh, and you can see all this stuff. We have another question that asks, why focus on Poland specifically? What is unique about it among various social socialist experiments? Well, Poland in this sense was the project I have there's two answers to that. One of them is just the pra pragmatics of the project. So the the project has selected particular countries to highlight in discussing the realities of socialism. And and so this is the project from Fraser. Uh, Poland is a uniquely um, kind of structured economy because of the role that Balcharovich played. Uh, you know, one of the things that's weird for economists is leadership matters <laughs> and, 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 you know, economists are tend not to be good at that. We tend to focus on worlds in which the, the value of any one individual is of zero because, you know, we want to analyze the, the systematic structures rather than the particularities. But again, like in the market economy, if we don't have a theory of entrepreneurship, we don't really explain how markets work. In a similar idea, talking about political reforms, if we don't have these change agents like a Balcharovich. So Poland had experienced a, um, a very significant set of, of reforms, shock therapy that were introduced. And so that makes it one of the more interesting cases among the post-communist world to study. Um, and so that's you know what attracted us to this, the pragmatics of the project, focusing on Poland, and then the reality that Poland has particular important insights about what might be called testing the Washington consensus, right? And 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 looking at that. And so we're playing that out in terms of, of the way. So just think about like what Poland did with its economic freedom. In uh, 1990, Poland was by the Economic Freedom Index was uh, ranked in the 100, 105 uh, most free economy in the world, the 105th. You know, in 2015, it was number 47. That is a tremendous transformation of a society and draws our attention to, to wanting to understand it. Thank you. Um, uh, we have another question in the Q&A section that is asking, uh, what would be your advice for certain countries like the U.S. that seem to be looking into socialism as an option? Because we have this narrative that capitalism is bad. It seems that socialism is being on the rise. Cuba influence has grown. Venezuela power power due to their resources and South America has helped expand it through South America. And here in the U.S., especially after COVID, we see this narrative that our system is all bad. Um, uh, this was the question that was posted. Yeah, so I think this is part of the reason why this project at Fraser was undertaken was to counter the contemporary narrative about socialism. Um, I think, you know, so I, I, I wrote my, my dissertation and my first book is on the political economy of Soviet socialism. It studies the first 10 years of the Soviet experiment. My second book is on the last 10 years of the Soviet experiment. Um, I had long planned to write a book about the middle period 
uh, you know, in the operation of the system. And I've published various essays in that, and that's in my book, Calculation Coordination. But I never did really write the book about the complete operation of the Stalinist economy and, and, and all of that. But that, that's my background. And one of the things I want to try to communicate to young people today is that the phrase democratic socialism does not do the work that they think it does. Because in the earlier period, they also wanted to call themselves democratic socialists. This gets forgotten. It's not like you know Lenin came to power with the idea of being a totalitarian socialist. Soviet, the word Soviet in Russian is about worker councils, right? This is what you have to understand. These are like, we're giving true democratic freedom to the workers. That was the idea. So when Hayek writes The Road to Serfdom, he dedicates it to socialists of all parties, not as a snarky kind of claim, but as a genuine claim, because at the time people were saying, I have to be a socialist in my economics because I'm a liberal in my politics. What Hayek's point is, is that if you become a socialist in your economics, you'll have to abandon your liberalism in your politics and you'll end up by getting hell on earth. That lesson still hasn't been absorbed into the youth that everywhere and anywhere we try to implement a socialist agenda, we end up by facing control problems, knowledge problems and incentive problems, which reinforce one another that lead to a concentration of power in the elite of that society and a loss of freedom among the people in that society. And so we have to really do our job in communicating that to young people today. And I think that we failed in that as educators. And so this is a challenge to all of us as educators to make sure that we are doing a thorough, dispassionate scholarly analysis of how it is that this system can generate the kind of tragedies that it did in the 20th century. So we have to have an accurate accounting of the tragedies. We have to focus our effort on being able to explain the why, the how and why of all of that. And we have to be able to explain that it's not something that is just random, that it is a consequence of the systematic forces at work when you try to abolish private property rights you're going to end up by having a control problem, an incentive problem, and a knowledge problem, which in turn end up by concentrating power, generating economic deprivation, and the you know the need for those in control in a world of this economic deprivation to end up by trying to rule through terror and the squashing of civil society um, in these ideas. And so... This is what we need to communicate um, as best we can. So, and that's true. And there's nothing unique about the United States that says that we can't go down the wrong path. Uh, we made a choice in the early part of the 20th century that we regulated rather than nationalized, right? That was a choice that was made. Britain nationalized rather than regulated. Britain ended up by having its economy go into stagnation and all of the other issues that were involved. All right. Um, this is an important thing to understand. You know, why was Margaret Thatcher important? Because she reversed that trend. We became a bloated bureaucracy. That's why Ronald Reagan reversed that trend here, at least in rhetoric um, and, and changing that. And we kind of need um, a renewal of understanding the arguments and um, last thing I'll say about this is I'm very hopeful uh, that uh, Jennifer Burns' biography of Milton Friedman, which is due out next month, will have a wide, wide readership because I think that, um, you know, Pre President Biden, you know, recently said Milton Friedman is no longer in charge. But the reality is that Milton Friedman's wisdom and insight is something that we need uh, for this day and age, uh, probably you know, more than at any time since he was writing um, in the 1960s when we were so far uh, going down the wrong path. And I think that, you know, other young writers and, and other young economists and political scientists and historians need to pick up and do it. And I think Friedman gives us an excellent example. And Jennifer Burns's biography on Friedman is just a brilliant piece of scholarship.
Thank you. Um, our next question is, why focus on incompetent versus competent or versus corrupt judges? They were never held accountable. Sachs yeah. apologized for this from my understanding. Right. So in the terms incompetent, that includes corrupt. So when I when when in that literature, when you put incompetent, that includes also on the take, you know, corrupt judges and stuff. Um, another question we have here in the chat is, oh, sorry, they're popping up. Um, given Poland's recent resurgence and increasing prosperity in recent years, despite its horrible mistreatment during World War II and repression under the Soviet Empire, what are the lessons for so many other much less successful post-colonial countries today? Um, okay, that's a... You know, that's a complicated story. Bill Easterly, the economist at NYU who focuses on development economics, he has a book coming out that you should be really paying attention to. It's not out yet, but it's it's called Saviors versus Skeptics. And what he does is he divide, the, 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 divides the development class, development economists, into those who think of themselves as saviors of societies and those who are skeptics of Western efforts to save societies. And it turns out, you know, the interventionists, the development planners are all the saviors and the market oriented people are the skeptics. You know, everyone has the right to be free. Everyone has the ability to lift themselves up from and escape the poverty trap. What all they need is the elbow room to be free to, as Deirdre McCloskey puts it, to give it a go uh, and, and, and whatnot, rather than rely on the government to orchestrate solutions for them. And so I think that one of the questions that you have to ask in, in, in post-colonial economies is one, you know, how about, what's about the betrayal of the West? Uh, meaning, you know, when these, you know, advisors and whatnot come in, rather than having looking for indigenous solutions we're always offering these you know advice from afar to try to do things they don't necessarily fit culturally uh, with these societies the influence of socialism and interventionism is quite rampant uh, at in, in the post-colonial period uh, all you have to do is think about india as an example of that and so what we need to do is we need to sort of correct that i would argue and instead cultivate an appreciation of why we're skeptical of the savior, why we want to rely on an entrepreneurial solution. And so one way to think about this is that the kind of economics that I would advocate uh, wants to argue that ordinary people can do extraordinary things if just given the freedom to choose. Whereas other types of economics say extraordinary people can orchestrate extraordinary things if just given the power. And so this is the problem, I think. I think we need to make sure that we don't exercise the power to try to orchestrate economic growth and development. What we need to do is unleash the entrepreneurial spirit in these various countries. And if we did that through opening up of trade, through allowing the free flow of labor and capital, we would end up by seeing economic miracles all over the world. There's no constraint to the economic miracles, no natural constraint. The constraint is imposed on them by government policies, which make it costly for individuals to pursue productive specialization and realize peaceful social cooperation through exchange. And that's, in a nutshell, what we really have to communicate to young people. Thank you. It looks like we have time for just one more question. And I see in the chat uh, there's one question. Um, based on your research, do you have any predictions or expectations as to the future of the Polish economy for growth? Wow. So like other countries in the period of time after the global financial crisis, there has been a rise of populism. All right. And, and, and you know, which have led to restrictions in the economy that we didn't anticipate they would be doing and going forward. 
And Poland is no different than, than any of the other places in that regard. And so we have to fix that issue at first. Here's the thing, you know, George Orwell told us that the future of humanity is a giant boot stepping on its face. And I like to tell everyone, it doesn't matter whether or not that boot is on the right leg or on the left leg. If it's stamping on your face, it's stamping on your face, okay? So we need to make sure that first and foremost, that we stop the boot stamping on our face. The second thing that we need to do, and that, that's a function at some level, I'm an economic educator. So at some level, what's my responsibility as an economic educator to communicate? I think, you know, this is a particular example of the history and operation of socialism, but I think there's a broader issue, which is about economics as a science. And so I, I'd like to end, you know, making an appeal for that. So imagine your students at the Institute there, you know, learning economics and communicating economics to them. And I think the first and foremost thing is that we have to see that economics is a tool for the curious and a discipline for the compassionate, right? So we don't want to, we want to actually utilize economics to be able to understand the world out the window rather than just the models and empirical techniques that economists use among themselves to try to make propositions more rigorous. Those are important, don't get me wrong. That's part of what we do as a science. But in our task as educators, we have to let people see economics as a set of eyeglasses. And when they put on those eyeglasses, they bring the world into sharp relief. And so it's about unleashing the curiosity of our students and allowing them to see how the world works. And so in my book that was mentioned, earlier four pillars of economics, I stress the four pillars of, you know, we live in a world of scarcity. Scarcity implies trade-offs. Trade-offs need to be negotiated. In order to negotiate them, we need the importance of property prices and profit and loss. That's like the truth in the light of economics. And we have to communicate that. But economics also teaches us the beauty and awe of the invisible hand, of spontaneous order of the market. And we need to cultivate in our students an appreciation of this unplanned order that can result from giving people the freedom of choice. Third, economics teaches us hope because it's through entrepreneurship, right? And, and, and the constant sort of recognition of being able to imagine better worlds to solve social problems, to solve actually real problems in the economy through entrepreneurial innovation that we end up by doing better tomorrow than we're doing today. And so we need to see hope in the project of, of economic freedom. And then finally, with compassion, because who benefits the most from economic freedom is the least advantaged in society. They're the ones who are lifted up and are able to escape you know, poverty. And so if you, if you just look at a basic fact, in 2015 was the first year in human history, the first year in human history that less than 10% of the global population was living in extreme poverty. That was precisely because of the era of globalization, the spread of markets, the introducing of the Chinese and Indian populations into the global economy. And so this is what we need to be teaching young people because, and, and also one last thing on this is that when you do the studies like David Dollar's studies at the World Bank, one of the things that they found out is sure the rich got richer, but the poor got richer at a faster rate than the rich got richer. So the least advantage were growing at a faster rate in their going up the income class than the, than the rich were. And so again, we need to disabuse people of things that they, they think they know that ain't so and be able to substitute for that solid knowledge about how economic systems work and how this discipline of economics can open their eyes to so many fascinating aspects of the world that are understood once we follow economics. So that's that would be my that would be my final pitch. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Betke. Um, it looks like we are out of time. I would like to thank Dr. Betke um, and all, all of you who joined us today. Uh, if you are interested in attending other upcoming events, making a gift to IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please visit IWP.edu.
Thank you so much again, sir. I'm thrilled and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I put my email in the chat. So if anyone is interested in, in writing to me, I will be thrilled to respond. And good luck for the rest of the year. Thank you very much.